This episode is sponsored by Manscaped. England win their first ever test match in Japan. And it was a very solid outing for Steve Borthwick's side, but it came at a cost. Hello amateurs and welcome back to our summer test series. Here with you throughout the summer, so hit subscribe down below to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now then, as I said, this was England's first ever test match in, in Japan. Sorry, playing against Japan in Japan. Obviously, they were there for the World Cup. And I've got to be said, the pitch and the ground and everything just looked amazing. It looked completely pristine, as you, as you would expect, I guess. But it did look great. But that didn't stop England having a poor start to this game. Some really sloppy handling, actually, just allowed Japan into the game. And they got a first points on the board with a penalty and 3-0. And during these opening phases, Japan looked fast, they looked fluid, but they looked really, really physical as well. They were banging into absolutely everything and for a lot of time with really good effect. England was struggling defensively. I mean, with the defensive system they play, there's always going to be gaps, there's always going to be space, but it's the way they fill that afterwards, having put pressure on, that really counts. So it may look a bit ragtag, taggy, you know, a bit of a mess sometimes, but that is part of the plan. And during this defensive phase, actually, there's some really big hits going in as well. And, and England's wings hit two of the biggest with Feo Boso and Tommy Freeman whacking back some uh, Japanese players. But it was all Japan in those opening phases. They were getting all the penalties. They were looking dangerous. Uh, but England, as I said, did defend really aggressively as well. The one area that England did look dominant in... And maybe it was just because we're on loose head side uh, of the scrum. But England looked dominant in the scrum um, with Bevan Rod going very well uh, in this test match. Overall, I thought he had a really good game. But I was, when we get into the second half, we'll see that actually the Japanese loose head was doing a pretty good job on Dan Cole as well. So I think both loose heads probably had the edge uh, in the scrum battle. But it was a penalty in the scrum. The Japanese tight head flattening out and going belly first to the ground. That led to field position and England battered away through the forwards. A little slip pass from Ben Earl to Chandler Cutting himself, getting over for, I think, his first ever England try. He had to really muscle his way through Michael Leach to get there. Classic play from him. That's very much what he's known for. During these phases as well, Japan playing super fast, really fast, as you would expect, moving the ball of contact. But they were kicking a lot as well. They were really kicking more than I can ever remember a Japanese Japanese side kicking. And that led to a, a Mitchell counter-attack. Looked like England had really torn them apart. And Ben Earl tried to catch the ball one-handed and knocked it on when I'm pretty sure they would have gone pretty much the length of the field for a try. But England did get another try shortly afterwards through Marcus Smith. And this was a beautiful play. A long line-out over the back of the line-out to Ollie Lawrence, who fainted back inside to Sam Underhill. And I think... It all came too easily. Japan were really slow off the line. I think Oli Lawrence was expecting a lot more pressure very quickly and it didn't come. But he played out the back to Mitchell. He played out the back to Marcus Smith, who just danced through a massive hole, rounded the fullback for a beautiful try. The passing was very slick and very accurate, but I think against a stronger team defending, it might have been a bit tougher for England there. And that's probably a theme of the day, actually. Japan did a lot of things right, but I felt like their defence was just a bit passive at times. They did put in some big hits and some big tackles, but there are times when they really needed to put pressure on England's attackers. Uh, OK, next one. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was funny. Uh, so Marcus Smith kicked a brilliant 50-22. I initially, when I was watching, I was like, we got numbers on, on the left here and, we, and space to move it to. But Marcus Smith identified that there was a ton of space in the backfield as well. And smartly, really smartly and accurately whacked a 50-22, which led to some pressure. A tap penalty by Bevan Rod where he tapped it and just stood still with the ball, like looked at the referee. The Japanese players ran towards him. It was a very strange moment. But that did lead to uh, Feo Waboso getting over in the corner with a brilliant pass from Marcus Smith. Took it right to the line and then whipped it very shorthanded over the top. And last player of the, game, uh, the of the half, another brilliant assist by Marcus Smith when he sort of realised that going left wasn't the right option, chopped back, crossfield kick and Henry Slade read it perfectly, running onto the ball to get over in the corner. This was also really um, smart play. I don't know whether they noticed it or not, but it was the Japanese 12 that was defending that. So if you're not used to catching the ball over your shoulder and all that kind of stuff, it makes it very difficult. And he really... Was, should probably have been favourite to get that kick. 
but lost it in flight and Slade took advantage for 26-3 at half time. And England have played well in patches. They were definitely, they were very efficient in the red zone. I think they got a try out of each of their first three entries. But Japan were playing a big part in this game as well. As I said, really physical, but just a lot of handling errors on each side. Greasy ball, I'm sure, with the humidity. England came out second half and flew. Like they really picked up the physicality and the pace, which allowed Mitchell to scoot over for 33-3. And another theme of this game actually was the line out. And Japan uh, consistently gave England the front of the line out free. And you could hear Otoji shouting, cancel, cancel, shoot, 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 repeatedly throughout this game. Um, which obviously moved to the front and get up quick because that's where the space was. And England just took it. They just took the ball when it was there, which leads to lower quality possession. So I'm, I'm interested in that tactically, whether they thought, OK, we don't need that high quality possession here. We just want to win the ball and then we can play from there. I noticed this during the Six Nations as well. They, they were trying to get good quality ball and sometimes lost it. I think they've gone more conservative and they just want to win the ball now. And they can generate momentum after that through the second or third phase if necessary, uh, not necessarily through the first phase and, and really high quality ball. Japan were defending really well, again, around the fringes, but eventually the dam burst and Mitchell put Ben Earl over. Ben Earl, who didn't, oh, I don't know, he wasn't as effective as he has been during the Six Nations, but man, he never stopped trying. He was always whacking people, always carrying hard. He just didn't quite find the space that he had done um, during the Six Nations. But like I say, he was ridiculous during that period. So uh, shortly after that, Marcus Smith got a yellow card for a, an early tackle. And this tackle was early by probably two and a half to three seconds. He was literally running along, holding on to the Japanese player, uh, waiting for the offload to come. It was a stone cold yellow card. Uh, correct decision by the referee not to give a penalty a try because uh, Dan Cole was there and he was definitely going to stop that player from scoring. No question whatsoever. Harry Randall came on shortly afterwards and he really raised the pace of England's attack. Mitchell was obviously a will of the wisp, fast, darting scrum half, but it was noticeably quicker when Randall came on. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just the phase of the game and this kind of stuff. But, man, England's attack really sped up after that. And Harry Randall himself benefited by darting through a gap that Michael Leach left when he overfolded. And that means that the ball's always the biggest threat. And he, he was trying to deal with a threat that he thought was going to come on the far side. Wasn't looking at Randall, who picked the ball up and Randall darted through that hole for a try in 45-3. What happened next was great because Japan had played a lot of good rugby. And in the first half, they were very close to breaking through and very close to scoring a number of times. Like just one pass missing. Uh, and Nazuka got over for a try on the corner with a from a great pass from second row, Dern, throwing it out there. And then shortly afterwards... Dern again looked like a basketball player. There was a juggling ball somewhere around the halfway line. He stuck a big arm out and scooped it back and that foxed everybody in the England defence. He charged through, put Yamasawa in for a second Japanese try and suddenly 14 points in, in three minutes and it was 17.45. They were never coming back into the game, but Japan really deserved one if and, and if not both tries. So fair play to them for sticking at it and getting those scores towards the end. Now, I said in the intro... This win came at a cost for England and it happened in the 72nd minute, charging forward on attack, really good uh, setup play. Charlie Yules, reckless, really reckless uh, into a ruck and took out Michael Leach at the knee. Leach was kind of bouncing up and down. I wonder if Yule saw him and he thought maybe he was going to go down to try and steal the ball. And that was why he was so low. It, I mean, Charlie Yules is not a dirty player, but this did look like a bad contact. Fortunately for Leach, he got his foot out of the ground, so he, there was no damage done. But this was yellow card and put on review uh, to potentially be a red. Sam Under, Underhill got over for England's final try on 52-17 shortly after from an absolutely flying driving maul. And then at the kickoff, Charlie Yules found out that his yellow card had been upgraded to red. He got sent off in his previous England game, which was two years ago against Ireland. And sent off again in this one. I feel so sorry for him because he is not a dirty player and he's had a fine season. He's really played in the best rugby, I think, of his career right at this moment. That's going to be the end of his tour. I'm sure he, he won't go to New Zealand now. Somebody else will come up uh, and and get the opportunity. Uh, maybe if you look into the future, maybe someone like Rossi Tuima 
from Exeter, who's who's up and coming, big heavy second row. He might get the call up. I don't know. We'll see. But I, f- I feel really sorry for Yules. So glad that Leach didn't get injured. But yeah, these are the things that happen. So what do we think? What do we think? What do we think Steve Borthwick will think of this result? I think, or the performance more importantly, I think he'll be... I think he'll be quietly happy. You know, coming back together, there's always, it always takes a little bit of time. I think England looked fit. I think they looked powerful all the way to the end of the game. And that was a concern in the heat and humidity of Japan. But they looked, I thought, really well conditioned. I think a lot of players uh, had very solid games. I thought Bevan Rod up front was very good. I thought Charlie McCullough himself, while he was on the pitch, had a load of really good involvement. Some big tackles, the try and some heavy carries around that as well. Uh, his first start, and I thought he did really well in the backs. I'd say Marcus Smith was the standout. He There was a lot of space out there, to be fair, and, and not a huge amount of pressure on him. But man, his execution, like he'd putting people in space, dominating the game. His kicking game was absolutely on point as well. Uh, and I thought he was he was excellent, along with Tommy Freeman on the wing. Again, he just he's doing the things that are really important for an international wing. The kick chase, the retrieving kicks, the cover tackles, the defending, you know, and then he didn't have a huge amount of opportunity in open play to run himself today, but he did all those key core things really well. Uh, so, yeah, I think England, England attacked pretty well. There were a few errors. Sometimes Slade and Lawrence didn't weren't quite on the same wavelength, but that will come. That will come. I think defensively, they continued where they were. They were really aggressive, and I think they covered the mistakes or the you know the gaps that opened up their uh, scramble defense was really good as well so yeah i think steve borthick will be will be pretty happy with probably the charlie yours red card the only real sour point for eddie jones i think japan showed a huge amount in attack uh, i'd like to see them actually keep the ball a little bit more i think they kicked too much i think defensively they're a little bit passive but their set piece was excellent their scrum went really well for the most part and their lineup was superb as well. So there's lots there for Japan, and especially considering they were a very young side. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce that Smooth Sack Summer is officially upon us. When you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you're groomed from pubes to bum. Thanks to our friend at Manscaped, you can make this season your smoothest yet. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate bundle to keep your boys downstairs cool while looking hot. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Get 20% off and free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use the code TARP20. That's T-A-R-P-20. Summertime and the trimming is easy. Have you really done any male grooming if you haven't nicked a nutsack? I know I have and I have to say I've never felt more confident thrashing through the bushes than with the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the belt. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. The Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra has everything you need to prepare that summer bod. The fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. We also have dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones, three length setting combs, and oh, did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too. Beach, lake, or shower, this razor will devour even the strongest pubes. Now that you have the perfect haircut, use Manscaped's liquid formulations to keep that freshness, even at the hottest summer barbecues. The Crop Soother After Shave Lotion and Crop Preserver Anti Chafe Ball Deodorant. Once they touch your sack, you'll never go back. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TARP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TARP20, T-A-R-P, the Amateur Rugby Podcast, 20 at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. Okay, back to the show. Lastly, the viewing experience on Rugby Pass TV, I thought was really good. Um, and fair play to uh, David Flatman. Ben K, Topsy Ojo and Ellie Kildun for filling the full 15 minutes at half time. You know, most TV channels, there's adverts, so they'll do a two minute block and then a three minute block or whatever, or they'll go to some kind of interview somewhere else. But they had to do all of that. And I thought they did it really well, especially when they went back to commentators, Nick Heath and Tom May, 
a little bit early. They were nowhere to be found. And they styled that out with a lot of comedy as well. Um, Nick Heath and Tom May, by the way, I think are really excellent on comms. They make a, a really, like a really good match. They pair very well. Um, very considered. A lot of humour in there. But some really, really good detailed insight tactically and technically as well. So really good stuff from them. Uh, I think England will be happy here. I think Eddie Jones will be reasonably happy as well. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll, and I'll join you there for a friendly conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there. If you don't mind, it helps other people find it and you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next and do not forget to get out and play.